The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spin-Off with help from Callaghan Innovation, New Zealand's innovation agency. Here's your host, Simon Pound. You've probably heard of Dollar Shave Club, My Food Bag and Zero subscription businesses that have popped up in many areas of life because they make for great business. If you work out your average revenue per customer and your churn rate, that's the rate at which customers leave, and then work out what a customer costs you to acquire, and you can make those numbers right, you can project future income in the way that has turned zero and push pay into massively valuable companies, even before they turn to profit. We're used to them in software, but one place that they are pretty innovative is clothing. And that's where today's guests have brought their idea. As You Were is a clothing subscription service for men that provides elevated wardrobe essentials, providing the kind of wardrobe anchors that are needed in the month they come. So tees and linen shirts and shorts in summer, and jackets and cashmere cotton sweaters in colder months. The idea has attracted some big name supporters, with people like Dan Carter choosing to buy their wares, and it comes from brothers with some of the credentials. Sam and Noah Hickey hail from fashion and subscription business backgrounds. Sam was a stellar designer for Huffer straight out of uni, and Noah an all-white and business leader who played a key role in a huge growth of Pushpay. To talk the insight, the journey, and getting men to trust them, Noah and Sam join us now. G'day, thanks for coming along. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good morning. Hey, so yeah, let's talk a bit about those um, those backgrounds first. So, Noah, first as a, as a sportsman and then into some, you know, really big high-performance companies with Pushpay, probably the best known there. What were the kind of commonalities there? I guess, well, actually, when I was playing football, <clears throat> my favourite movie was The Wolf of Wall Street, and not because of his approach to life or any other part. <laughs> um, and, and sorry, it was actually Wall Street, and then it went into that. Uh, it, was, it was all about looking at things, looking at the outcomes, and just going and being as good as you possibly can. And in sport, that's all I was doing. I was going earlier to training, trying to do as, as much as I can to be as good as I could. And uh, wasn't necessarily the absolute most talented, but if I put the work in, I knew that I'd get a good outcome or an outcome that at least I got a good professional career and, and got to win a title and the like. Uh, business is no different. Just put in far more work, get as much information as you can and, and use it as much as you can. And the team mentality out of high performance sports especially has become more and more popular over the years, hasn't it? With places like Netflix very famously having a culture that's based around the idea of keeping the best team on the field the whole time. So it's not a family, it's a high performance team. 100%. And I'll go and try to meet as many teams as I can and see their dynamics and see what they do. And then you sort of stick to a thing. If I can't be the best version of myself or I can't get the very most out of myself, how do I ever expect to get that out of someone else? And so, and that's team, you know, I'm very much a team person and that's been my love, which business gives you 24 seven. 
And what what businesses did you go into? Because you had um, your own kind of ventures uh, in fashion and stuff as well, didn't you? Uh, in, in clothing making as well. And then uh, also working with some um, quite big names and kind of private wealth. Yeah, very much so. I actually came out of sport thinking I was going to save the world and did a charity called Shine, which was going out and trying to get young New Zealanders, young New Zealanders to stop thinking about others and just be as good as they could be. And, and that went well. And then through that, I got to meet a whole lot of different people. And one in particular was Peter Hewlich, who you know I stand by today saying it's probably the, the most influential person that I've had in business for me. And I've learned unbelievable amounts from but uh, So I got to go in and I got to do business development for Hewlett Wealth Management. Then I got to learn the ropes. Then I went into Fisher Funds after Hewlett got acquired and learned the ropes there even more. And you know, continuing just to learn and learn and learn. And that's, I, I think that's all I'm ever doing really is I'm just learning. And, uh, and I keep getting better for it. Um, and we had a children's clothing business that I was involved in, which was actually a family friend of ours, Barbara McCamish. She's an amazing woman. Uh, why Mama Why? And she's carried that on into Carbon Soldier. And we we learnt a lot through that. We, you know, big orders at farmers and the design, going up to China, getting all of the ins and outs of that. Uh, and then I've done a little bit through sport um, over that time as well, been on the board of the Phoenix, uh, through to investing in early into push pay and being able to see the rapid growth play a role in some parts and then also just watch the extraordinary people that they've got involved there. Uh, and mostly you know, for me, Peter, that I got to learn from. So I look at my education and the people I've got to work with, um, and it's been unbelievable. Yeah, and, and push pay is, is such a story. We might, we might come back to that a little bit more as we talk about the subscription business a little bit later. Uh, you, you know, I think because most of it's happened in America, it's just not as well known here what an extraordinary execution story uh, that has been. Uh, but, but Sam, so like, and tell me about your your kind of path in towards this. Which I mean, I remember um, uh, your show out of Rookie when you were at AUT that got picked up, and then you went straight to Huffer, and that was like huge news. It was like, whoa, how did this happen? Yeah, it was pretty amazing to be honest. I actually um, remember going or having the conversations about this role coming up, and was. Oh, hang on. <laughs> really? I'm just looking at like an internship. Um, and I remember going into the interview for like first interview and I was actually working with Noah at the time on um, at Hewlett Wealth Management, just within the KiwiSaver scheme. And I turned up to the first interview fully suited. <laughs> and I, needless to say, it didn't put them off too much. In the next few interviews, I actually made a little more effort to be street conscious. Uh, <laughs> but my time there was amazing. It was such a good opportunity. Obviously, straight out of university, that is something that I think anyone would dream of, working for such an iconic brand with such an Already long history. I think it had been about they've been around sixteen years at that stage. So there was already a great um, portfolio of stuff that I could really take inspiration from. And Steve and the team there really let me kind of sink my teeth into what I saw the vision, what my vision would be for the brand. So I really, over the three and a half years I was there, that kind of just developed. Whereas I kind of got to take Huffer in the direction that I thought it should be and really learn around what New Zealand males wanted as well. Um, and again, with those learnings, it was kind of with a store like Huffer or brand like Huffer, they're selling to so many stores and to so many New Zealanders. It was just a really great place to learn and kind of. Yeah. And it's such a unique brand and like it's cool for 15 year olds who are wanting to like look their absolute best at the mount for New Year's and then their dads are wearing it too and they don't mind and there's so few brands in the world that pull that off like you know like Polo or something's probably another one where you've got like multi-generational people wearing it in different ways and and feeling good. Completely and that's I think the beauty of it is that that age span that it goes between it's it's kind of it is crazy (laughs) and having been around for 20 21 years that I think it just is a testament to the brand that they've managed to maintain that and maintain that customer throughout their growing up, their like adolescence to their adulthood. 
And being a designer for a company like that, like it's like running a bunch of little businesses, hey, because you've got like uh, you've, you've got a, a collection to do. There's budgets against it. There's money you've got to make out of it. You've got to be commercial, but also creative. You've got to make sure the team kind of um, that get, gets everything done right. And that's a lot straight out of uni. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, there was already an amazing team there, obviously, that um, really kind of guided me in the in what the processes were. And then there was a lot of learning just along the way because uh, although I did the Bachelor of Fashion Design at AUT, which was an amazing start to kind of learn those uh, fundamentals of design, but as soon as you're thrown into the industry, it's a whole different uh, ball game. I mean, I hadn't done production overseas. I had like worked with China, so it was a whole new, um, whole new bit of learning, really. And then working on campaigns and everything. I think I'm still so proud. Like I was watching some videos the other day of some of the campaigns we produced, and they're still awesome to this day. I'm, like really proud of the collections we made, and yeah, just the team. It was some awesome times and out of there what london called you got the the kind of uh the the itchy feet for the overseas yeah. experience yeah to be honest i've yeah had such a good thing going at hover but wanted to go over and kind of experience things on a different scale um and the uk is obviously great for that with europe on its doorstep a lot of my favorite kind of brands were coming out of there um so going over there and trying to learn about a kind of a bigger market was really the draw card for us, or for me, or and Talia, my partner. <laughs> and then w- when you were there, you were working um, still in the same kind of roles? or uh, Yeah, it was a little bit different. Uh, <laughs> going for head of design means we're designer roles in the UK when you're 25 isn't really a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was, went into more of a product development style role, which then in turn got my foot in the door uh, in the company Perry Alice, working on original Penguin, and then got to do designs working specifically with department stores. So I was working with the likes of John Lewis, House of Fraser, JD Sports, Gallery Lafayette, and designing capsule collections for them that would sit alongside the main line. Uh, Basically, I got to work with all the buyers of these department stores and read their reports, find out what the top sellers were, and create products that were for these markets. And that was a really commercial market as well with those those kinds of department stores. It was really good learning of what the general population of the UK and outer Europe were kind of were looking for. And that's so interesting because after that you came back to New Zealand with pretty much the exact opposite of just meeting the market with whatever they wanted and keeping it kind of changing and moving uh, with a single product line brand. Tell me about <laughs> tell me about Samuel Joseph Linen, which a lot of people um, listening probably would have seen arrive a couple of years ago with the cool pop-ups and the great kind of press. Yeah, well, I guess one thing is I don't think that model is right that I was learning about. <laughs> yeah. So coming away with that is a good learning. <laughs> Um, the, the, the fast fashion model isn't yeah, sustainable. Like, yeah, it just isn't necessarily how the consumer wants to shop, or how guys in particular. Um, but Samuel Joseph, I think, has been in the works for kind of a lot longer than just coming. 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Noah and I have kind of always gone back and forth from quite a young age on, oh, this could be better, this could be better in terms of clothing. And that really comes from our parents. Um, our mum used to make bikinis when she was, I think, like 13, 14. Uh, and then our dad actually made shirts. And they had a store together on the Sunshine Coast when um, they were younger, probably when Noah was a little whippersnapper. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Where I learned to ride the bike, actually, first time. They had a little shop right out in front of our house and... Uh, they were hippies, but uh, great for the world. So, um, yeah, we learn a lot from them in that space. Yeah, and then so then on kind of on my return, I'd actually come back. We'd been discussing this sort of thing for a, for quite a while, and I'd come back with a full kind of collection and big vision of what I um what I wanted to do. But then Noah really um kind of always always. Uh, what's the word? Pushes. Pushes, yeah. <laughs> Chal- challenges. Jel- challenges. Always, good, yeah. He's a challenger. It's a really, there's, a, there's a real euphemism that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We kind of just took a step back and thought, oh, 
No, I couldn't find a good linen shirt at the, at the time, and myself either. It was a, a summer, I think, 2016. So we thought, well, let's just start with really perfecting one item. So and um, that was basically the, the start of that concept. And I developed or like patterned and sampled the shirt, made like 10 different versions to kind of get it to the right fit. And now mum and dad's uh, sewing studio. <laughs> And every time that we try, I mean, it's the same with everything we do now. It's never right, basically. And, and, and you're always trying to find out from customers. So we tried it on different people. And what we've discussed this from such a long time ago. Literally, when I was 20, I was playing football in Europe. I'd come back. And Sam was only 10 because there's 10 years difference to us. And he'd jump in the car. We went on. I remember actually going up and uh, camping for the night at Goat Island, you know, me and my little 10-year-old brother, and um, talking because I was sponsored by Puma at the time and he'd always have Puma gear that he got from me and he'd talk about the shoes and the T-shirt and what about I've had this and this. And so from a young age, he's always been looking at how you can do something, what could be slightly better yeah, with cool. it. Um, and then that led us into with the linen shirt is, okay, when you were solving a problem, which is what we always want to be able to do for people because otherwise what are you doing it for? And we did that. We had a whole lot of people who were like, oh, if you do a linen shirt, I'll buy one. And bam, that's exactly what happened. It, but then, yeah, the, the interesting thing there is like once they bought one, do they keep buying them? So you've got the perfect shirt uh, and the perfect linen shirt. Uh, and, and what was the idea from there once you'd set that up, done the pop-ups, got your customers that made you go, well, maybe we need something every month for them? <laughs> yeah. Because there was uh, quite a lot of, just discussions, because what that enabled us is we sold, I think, about 400 shirts in the in the first month. That's in a pretty amazing customer base. Uh, and then so from having that customer base, it really enabled us to start asking them questions. Yeah. And we sold nearly a third of those on the first night, which was to friends and then word of mouth. And they came down straight away to just a little hangout pop-up that we had. Um, sorry, in the first two days, probably not the first night. Anyway, so a third of them were gone. And instead of going, great, we're going to make more, everything's going to be amazing – it was actually the last thing we did. We said, well, what do all these people want? Because they all were talking about different things over the night. So let's just find out their problems and let's really know our customer. That's one thing that my time in software has taught me in a big way is know your customer and fall in love with the problem. Don't fall in love with the, solu- the solution. Mm. Um, and what, what did you work out the problem you were solving for them was? Fit fabric was a big one at the start. Well, we worked out pretty quickly that we didn't know exactly what the problem was and that we had to then go out to our database. And our database was sort of probably about 56% people who we even didn't know um, through Viva and other publications that Sammy managed to get us in, which was great. And so we went out and just spoke to them, didn't we? Yeah, and just asked them all sorts of questions like what, what, what is missing from your wardrobe? What don't you like about shopping? And the feedback was kind of incredible. <laughs> yeah, what well, people said, I just hate shopping. And then <laughs> if you Google men hate, shopping comes up first. We found that out. Like, oh, interesting stat. That must have some pretty serious data in behind it if that's what's coming up all the time. Right. And, and why? So, so did you find out that what you were actually selling them with the, uh, the shirt was kind of – confidence and ease and uh safety that they were going to be buying the right thing like um yeah what what what, so so what evolved out of that is as you were which is then a monthly subscription of kind of you know elevated basics so how did you get from the shirt to the uh kind of anchors of the wardrobe when you need them thing well for me i would say our little genius in sammy is the guy who can make something keep refining it keep i mean every time i've got something i come up pinch it in an area and go, look at that. I'm like, wow, that is amazing. I love it. Just take my top off and get him to go and do that because he can sew, he can cut the patterns, he can do every last part of a process, which means that you, know, you can find things out really quickly um, and you can have quick, fast feedback loops. But um, So when we got to the stage that we, we knew what we should go out and start changing, then Sammy was able to really start refining what that process was and and who we were doing it for and 
all that we achieved, I would say, was Samuel Joseph. And this is harsh, but I know Sammy knows that I'm always going to be harsh in my <laughs> black and white uh, description of what's happened, was we got a really, really powerful database of a broad range of people who could tell us honest feedback and then from there would allow us to develop something that was solving a much greater problem than just a seasonal linen shirt. And yeah, to follow on from that, I think there's guys are really calling out for the the simplicity and quality. Uh, so the simplicity of the linen shirt and the quality of the fabrics, they want to see that in more products because find that quite hard to find. Uh, and then in those questions, there's uh, like a variety of different ways that guys shop, whether it's they do the annual shopping, they do the twice, like twice a year, or whether they're just frequent shoppers. Um, but I think with one thing with that is the guys that are doing that big annual shop or the twice a year, they're putting it off because they don't actually like it. So what the subscription kind of does is trying to f- give guys what they need when they need it and almost bring back a bit of a delight into shopping. Yeah. Uh, so. Did you hear from guys uh, about having bad experiences like that? Like if you only go out once a year to shop and you get an assistant who puts you in stuff that you don't look good in, you're going to look like a dick for a whole year. That was me. (laughs) (laughs) You're staring at him, Simon. (laughs) Um, It was, this is, this is funny. Another part of the research project is we went into my wardrobe and said, okay, because we were looking at everything, you know, we're looking at what about if we did the clothing with a styling aspect to it and Sam could come in and just literally style people. And that can't scale, but it was just all in our learnings as we were working through. So we went through my whole wardrobe and Sam would pick things out and then go, okay, that and that together and just took photos and did a photo board of it and ended up getting rid of two thirds of my entire wardrobe because it's that like I'll always wear a couple of colors. That's pretty much me and pretty simple when it comes to clothing and what I wear. But um, you'd have all these different colors in there that you just purchased because of exactly what you just said at that time. Like what about a bit of color? And you, oh, I could do a bit of color. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it might be a good looking um, retail support person who you're there with or uh, a guy who's cool and you're thinking, yeah, whatever he says is going to be cool on me too when you get home and – my wife would just say to me, you idiot, you look like such a dog. You can't do that. Cool people can. <laughs> and that was that's, that was some common feedback. It's almost like the cond. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that, yeah. I, can, I can think of like a, um, a cable jumper and it was like, yeah, it'd be great if it was like skiing and that's what I'm going to go skiing and that's what I'm going to go to the, the Alps. What yeah, do I do exactly. with this jumper? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, there's so many items like that and – shirts that just should never be near me you know i've seen other people and we've got heaps of our friends who are you know cool guys dan gosling mark moore steve Dunstan, all these people and they wear all this cool stuff and if that was anywhere near me i'd just look like <laughs> such a dork <laughs> and, and so that kind of idea of like really stripped back because if there's one thing about the kind of as you wear look it's like it's very tight isn't it it's like um simple monochromatic uh colors shapes that are um not about to go in or out of fashion in a minute because they kind of um, suit people and and kind of like that that elevated basics thing uh what, what led you to that well that's pretty much what we ended up with yeah <laughs> it's basically the whole idea is that it can work for a good variety of people and it's those elevated basics that are usually are kind of otherwise hard to find where the fits aren't too tight they're not too loose it's just kind of just right I yeah suppose. and then the customers told us i mean you know if we were to look around the room here i don't have the answers you don't have the answers together we've got the answers and that's kind of what we look at the community for and the customers would say things like i can never get the same item again you know it's such a good thing that they did last season and i can't get it or then they change the fit on me and why and and the fits and and all those parts to lead to a very simple form of uh of clothing, which is, is what it is, the simplicity is a key part of it. Um, all those questions were answered within the concept, and and sort of not jumping ahead into other questions and where we'll probably go. But in in terms of the data, then we get with subscription, and being able to have clothing that they can wear on and on and will last for you know however long the term is. And if baggy jeans absolutely come back in, then maybe we have to address that. <laughs> but <laughs> for now, you know, we've got what we've got. But um, the sizing as well, the sizing thing that we got feedback on 
is quite simple for us to do now when we have all of our subscribers' sizes. So we can tailor our sizing towards the the same you know, data that we have on file. And how, how's it going? So, so you launched with the idea and then um, it's, it's quite a big, I imagine, quite a big undertaking to work out kind of what uh, – what clothes and what styles and what colours and, and, and stuff to offer for a whole year ahead, but then get people in the journey at the beginning. Very much so. I mean, look, in terms of where we've what we've done in the last well, what was it, probably eight weeks really, all mm-hmm. up that we've really been doing this now, it's been phenomenal. I mean, it, the feedback and the people, every time I look at our Instagram account or look at what the messages that Sam is sending me there's a new person on there, Ricardo Christie, Dan Carter, Bowden Barrett. You know, it's it's nuts. Yeah, and those are the kind of people people would pay a lot to get to be endorsers for them. And they're, they're what, wandering in off the street and buying it by being part of your kind of network. Yeah, well, that, they, we just contacted uh, Ricardo. I've done stuff with him last year in surfing and then uh, the boys um, we kind of know. But you're never go- you can't get those guys to wear something. If they're not absolutely buying into it, that's that's the one thing. So it's got to have huge credibility to get someone like Bowden to post up, and then to see him in the day before his wedding and in the whatever women's magazine it was wearing it as his thing that he knew he was going to get photographed in. Um, that's what I think it gives. I mean, you know, that's what I always say to Sammy: you should just pinch yourself, mate, and just be so proud because you have designed and you took a long, long time to get that design right. That there, which the World Rugby Player of the Year is wearing. I mean, that's crazy. Pretty cool. <laughs> and, yeah, true. <laughs> speechless. Yeah. And, and, and wearing it by choice. That, that's yeah. really cool. And, and like, so why, why men? Like, you know, like uh, I, I remember um, – uh, you, you know, from a few journeys in the rag trade, someone saying that the only thing dumber than women's fashion was men's fashion. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, hopefully that's a, a, a lane that we get to sort of swim in on our own for a little bit. Then, if we can do a solution, get a get a jump on the competition and do something that solves a problem, because we're not going out there and trying to be the coolest people in the room. We're not going out there and trying to be anything but ourselves and and genuinely just, you know. My mum had a saying. She had a saying that we heard every single day, which was always make someone's life better um, after they've met you than before they met you. And you can you can just take that into business. You can take that into solutions. And I kind of – look, Sammy's had that when he was a huffer, going in and making the cuts, refining them, and, and they still live – long through to today, don't they? Yeah, yeah. there's def- oh, there's a f- few pieces still floating about, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty cool to see. And I think we're, like Ben, we kind of need more help <laughs> a little bit. Um, what I've found amazing is that almost like the ease that it's helped in my dressing in, in the morning, and I think that's something that a lot of dudes are looking for is just to make life that little bit easier and especially um, just – not having to think about that, especially a lot of our subscribers are busy people. They've got a lot on. They've got things that they'd probably rather be doing than shopping. And this is just another way to help them focus on what they want to focus on. Yeah, you do get that um, thing with the uniform dressing, don't you? Uh, with people like Mark Zuckerberg and stuff, always <laughs> wearing the same stuff just to have uh, a little bit more efficiency in their day, which is quite cool. And this kind of codifying that uniform a bit where you're telling people, well, you got the shorts and now wear the shirt with it and it's going to look good and you can also wear the bomber or the tee with it. Remember, uh, we went and sat on Ponsonby Road and it was at a stage where the feedback we'd got was, but won't everyone just look the same? So we went and sat on Ponsonby Road and we looked, Everyone looks the same. <laughs> so <laughs> that's not going to be a problem. You yeah. know, it's uh, it's already happening. And your staple items are uh, your staple items. That's what people wear right now. You'll most likely go to a party and see a couple of guys in a white t shirt. It's kind of, it's the way it is. <laughs> what does this consistency of, you know, doing one piece a month and releasing that allow you to do with kind of uh, telling stories about the suppliers and like being able to like take control of the supply chain and being able to um, advance things like sustainability that are so important in uh, this, which is, it's not fast fashion, but it is probably using some of the same chain as fast fashion. 
I think uh, a big part of it is the forecasting, mm. which has been pretty incredible for us. I think normally, say, with a direct consumer brand, you're almost you're ordering blind in a sense. Whereas we have a f- we have full we show full visibility of our products. So up until October, we've designed the collection, and so people have full visibility of that, and they select their colours. So we're actually ordering based on colour preference and size. So our kind of waste, I suppose, in a sense, becomes a lot less, and our forecasting becomes so much more accurate because of the data we're collecting. Yeah, and we're hugely passionate about the sustainability. And I mean, look, if you think about a couple of the people from New Zealand who have done, a, well, one in particular, he's done amazing things is Tim Brown, who we've both actually been there for the full journey of Tim Brown's uh, All Bird story. I mean, he called me to tell me he was going to retire uh, at 28, and I'd retired at 28. And then from there, I've just been through and seen, saw Tim last week, and uh, we sat and had a few GNTs for about six or seven hours talking about sustainability and what you need to do and how we need to do something greater with our lives. So we're trying to push and, and look at that as this next stages for the brand as well because we want to we want to solve a problem and then we want to continue to solve another problem and then have a greater cause. Uh, and it's something that we talk about a lot, but we wanted to solve this problem first and then we can look into those other pieces that are you know, evolutions of what we started on. Mm. I think, yeah, someone like Tim Brown and what he's done with All Birds is pretty inspiring and amazing for for the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of that, you know, retiring at 28, that's that's quite an amazing thing to do, eh, to kind of like to choose to kind of step out and then have a full ability to make a real contribution in a career as well uh, w- with that time. And I kind of like, it's quite interesting that you've got back into the fashion thing because doing my kind of Googling around, uh, there was a story about how um, with Why Mama Why there'd been a, an order uh, had been late for reasons out of your control. And so you were stuck with a million dollars of product you had to sell really quickly. And I mean, it must take quite a lot of um uh, uh, hardiness to then decide to get back into the fashion and the rag trade. Yeah, this is this is probably coming at it in a very very different angle than I'd ever looked at fashion in before, and it's it's largely thanks to a lot of the team at Pushpay, who I learned so much from. You know, the product people, the lead engineers. There's guys like Josh Robb, who will be a he'll be a huge name in in tech in New Zealand, and and he already is, but. Uh, I, I listened to all of the ways that they look at things and and in terms of the problems they solve and, and what they're doing. And I thought, actually, well, f- what we're doing here, it's very, very different than anything that I've ever done in fashion. So, I mean, as an example, we'd make ranges. They would go in and there'd be a big order for farmers and you'd go, oh, great. The order would get delivered, but you were already way back doing the other range, trying to get it ready, trying to deal with China to get minimums to get whatever it might be. And so I remember the day that I read an email that said the $1 million uh, order is cancelled because it's going to be, I think, two days late. It was right around when the GFC had just sort of hit pretty hard. And you've got two choices in life. You know, you immediately go, oh, and start crying. Or you go, okay, if we get a pop-up store there, 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 and there, that means we could sell that. Oh, my goodness, we're going to make so much more money off this because we're going to sell it retail. It's not going to be at that wholesale rate, which we were doing, which was too low anyway. But And it was just a huge opportunity. Um, and so, you know, every part of it, when Sammy and I are discussing things when he was in the UK and he's coming in with all this interesting information out of the department stores and seeing all these things that are broken, you got two choices. You're like, do we go and fix that or do we not? And... Obviously, we've chosen to to solve something. Uh, probably the most one of the most exciting things I've ever got to do, especially together with your bro. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> and what what advice do you guys have for people who are interested in like taking the jump and and doing something innovative in an industry? Um, I think having a mentor is pretty uh, important. Uh, having someone that you can talk to, bounce ideas off. I've never been one to work well on a solo sense so having a bit of a team that you can bounce ideas with uh, or get advice from is really important and kind of give you that guidance 
Yeah, and look, a big part of so many people who have a startup or a, a business that might be in clothing or whatever is they fall in love with their solution. And if you're not talking to the customer and you don't know the exact problem or the audience you're going after, you'll spend so much time and, uh, and energy going down different paths uh, that you, you just shouldn't be going down. Um, and then coming back to the TC, you know, the two choices, it starts when you wake up in the morning, you can choose whether oh, I'm tired or this is going to be a great day and I'm going to go out and make it happen. Um, just that one thing, I reckon TC, two choices. If you could nail that, you're going to be a long, long way forward from what uh, the everyday person is. How about success? How do you define success having had – uh, you know, r- really um, amazing success across a number of different um, points. What does success look like for you guys? <laughs> no, well, I mean, it's, look, for me, it, it, it's a football, I and mean, that's relevant. As you talk to my wife about it, what's it like being with a footballer, she'd say, well, he never even talks about it. It's got nothing to do with our lives. You know, everything that's been done has been done. So it's like if you can get 1% better every day, you're 37 times better at the end of the year. And for me, I just, today, I'm going to learn more. I'm going to be better than I was yesterday and and literally just doing those little steps and then being able to look at as, as big a vision as you can for a, a huge outcome which involves the world like America I know we can do because we've done it um, doing it again at the moment and um, just those little steps is what ends up taking on America or the world uh, for me yeah I think it's a good question <laughs> not one I've probably thought about too often but um, I think yeah, again, I'm learning a lot recently, I think in the last like, six months, even just getting fitter and having more clarity in things is kind of an element of success and getting uh, like 10,000 subscribers isn't like success to me, but if I can see a whole bunch of dudes looking good that otherwise weren't uh, in a position to do that and that we've helped them, I think. That's pretty awesome for me, seeing dudes walking down the street and my clothes looking cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Well, yeah, if you're, if you're interested in the journey, it's as you were. And thank you very much, uh, Noah and Sam Hickey, for sharing the story today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Joyce, thank you, Tina Tiller, for producing. And thank you very much for having us along and listening. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. Brought to you by The Spin-Off and Callahan Innovation. From The Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring. Brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tāmaki Makaurau, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.